In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he existed in the beginning with God. Through him all things were made, and apart from him was that anything made that was made. In him was life, and that light, life brought light to humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never overcome it. Yes, it's time to talk metaphysics. No! No, I don't want to talk metaphysics. No, metaphysics is too boring. No, I have no idea what metaphysics is. Metaphysics is the study of the realities behind physics. It's the study of the nature of the cosmos and of the origins of the world and of God and things like that. And more specifically, metaphysics is this. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And if there's any time of year when it is appropriate to talk metaphysics, it is surely today when we remember a very particular event that for the last 2,000 years or so of human history has been proclaimed as one of deep metaphysical significance. The birth of Jesus, the light that shines in the darkness, the word became flesh. I'm conscious of the fact that we don't talk metaphysics very often, partly just because it's not a polite topic of conversation. And partly because a lot of cl people claim to not believe in any sort of metaphysical reality anymore. But in truth, I I've never met anyone really, truly, that doesn't believe in anything beyond the plainly physical. I mean, some people speak of, of a force, or just of something out there, or values, or some sort of something, even amongst my supposedly atheistic friends, and there are a number, uh, tend to believe in the reality of rights and wrongs, and always seem to recognise something that is bigger than themselves, a certain set of truths or something that are not of human making and that defy any simple explanation. You can call it the force, or you can call it the towel, you can call it the moral fabric of the universe, you can call it what you wish. We all believe in something. John called it the word, which is our translation of the Greek word logos. And it's worth recognising that John deliberately chose a, a word with broad cultural relevance. Uh, in his day, as a reference to that fundamental metaphysical reality that we all believe in. I mean, it was a term that wasn't tied to any particular religious tradition. It was a term that had strong currency in the, in the philosophical teachings of Socrates and Plato. Uh, the word logos was simply that, really, that all-embracing term that John uses here to designate that mysterious reality that's at the heart of everything, in which all life and light finds its origin. And John's testimony is that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We don't like to talk metaphysics much. And I frankly don't like to talk metaphysics much either. I mean, even here in church, I don't talk metaphysics a great deal because metaphysics is theory. And uh, it's all about the intellect and what's going on up here. And I'd much sooner talk about light and, and life and love and human experience and about more than that than about any sort of esoteric theory. I mean, after all, who, whose life was ever changed by a theory? I used to spend a lot of time arguing with people at a theoretical level. Comes out of years of academia, I suppose. I used to argue a lot with people over issues of prejudice, in particular. Um, I've come to realise, as I get older, that the best of arguments rarely accomplishes very much. Uh, Islamophobia was always a sort of hot point for me. I'd spend any number of hours each week online 
arguing with people who would like to claim that the majority of Muslim people are sort of hiding suicide vests under their normal attire, just waiting for their opportunity to make their contribution to destroying civilization as we know it. And I would go into great detail pointing out that, well, it wasn't actually Muslim people who invented suicide bombing, it was the Japanese in World War II, and it wasn't them who revived it in this generation. I think that privilege belonged to the Tamil Tigers. And I'd point out that, well, the Muslim world has very genuine grievances against us in the West that need to be taken seriously, including the recent invasion and destruction of any number of Islamic countries and the ongoing tragedy of the Palestinian occupation. And I would point out that nonetheless, only a very tiny percentage of Muslim people are actually engaged in any form of hostile behaviour against Western countries. And I figured that these impregnable logical arguments would sort of topple all opposition and have Islamophobes everywhere saying, my apologies, I stand corrected. It didn't happen. And it led me to realise an important truth. I realised that people can't be shifted from their prejudices by the force of logic when they didn't adopt those prejudices for logical reasons in the first place. I found a similar truth to operate in religious arguments, which I also rarely engage in nowadays. I found that most people do not adopt their religious beliefs for logical reasons, and indeed most, most atheists I know don't adopt their non-religious beliefs for logical reasons. Uh, Hence, logic doesn't shift them. Logic has little to do with it. I mean, I'm sure there are some exceptions to this pattern. I've certainly found that most people I know who express a, a hostile disbelief in God, that it's not because of the force of logic has pressed them to abandon their religious dogma, but it's generally because something's happened to them. They've been abused by the church or had some other horrible experience that's made them question the belief that they were truly loved. Not many people become atheists by the force of pure logic, just as not many people become religious believers by the force of logic. There are exceptions, of course, and uh, I actually think of myself as one of those exceptions. Sorta. Of. Um, I, I was 18 when the compelling logic of religious truth brought me to my knees. It's probably not an entirely accurate description, but hear me out. Uh, my testimony is that shortly after I turned 18, I hit, uh, hit rock bottom, as we say in AA circles. At that stage of my life, I was uh, involved in a uh, lifestyle that was quite abusive and one in which I felt very much alone and one where realistically I had a very short life expectancy and I was at the time spouting uh, atheistic dogmas about there being no such thing as right and wrong and that people should be free to behave exactly as they please without the force of governments and religious institutions uh, coming down on them and trying to limit their behaviour. And it was my dad at the time who challenged me uh, to look within and to see if I could not find within myself those same moral realities which, whose very existence I was busy denying. And uh, I found that as I did that, I came to the inescapable conclusion that the life I was living was not one that was free, but one where I had a very genuine sense of the wrongness of a great deal of what I was doing. And in the process I realised that someone or something out there seemed to be generally interested in the way I lived. And that led me to prayer and that led me to an intense religious experience uh, that I've never forgotten. I, mean, I guess that's not really conversion by the force of logic. It's more 
a growing religious awareness associated with theories of right and wrong that, that did indeed lead me to then take up philosophy at university for the following four years and specialise in meta-ethics, which looks at the metaphysical basis of ethics. Even so, I guess it wasn't the theory that changed me and it's frankly not the theory that stayed with me. Um, it was the experience of meeting God, uh, that experience that I had on that night some 30 something years ago. I mean, so far as the value of logical arguments go, my understanding now, quite frankly, is that a good logical argument will give you permission, in a sense, to change your mind about something when you really already wanted to change it anyway. And logic alone, I believe, does not change us. Encounter with God and with other people changes us. Good theory just helps our minds to catch up with our hearts. I mean, I think that's as true for people who are Islamophobic as it is for atheists. I mean, if you want to help someone change their mind about Muslim people, uh, just organise a dinner where people of various different faiths are breaking bread together and where the fearful people are there alongside their Muslim sisters and brothers. Uh, you always find that after a, a night of warm conversation and friendship that all of a sudden those arguments about, against Islamophobia look a lot more logically compelling. Logic then allows the mind to catch up with the heart, but it's never the, never the leading edge of change. And the same is true, I, I think, with religious truth. People don't come to Christ by virtue of an, the inescapable logic of Christian dogma. They experience Christ and they meet God and all of a sudden those tired old dogmas take on new life. And this, of course, was exactly the experience of the Gospel writer. In the beginning it was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And yes, there's much that can be said about the Word or the Force or the mystery of the universe that makes a lot of sense. That's, there's that light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has never overcome it. And that may be true, but in and of itself it changes nothing and nobody but the Gospel writer says, but that word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son of the Father. No one has ever seen God. It is the word of God. It is Jesus who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Metaphysics. <laughs> no more metaphysics. Haven't we had enough metaphysics? Perhaps we have. And I agree that metaphysics as a purely philosophical discipline involving arguments and counter-arguments that go on endlessly can be as boring as it is useless. But what we have in the Gospel of John today is not simple metaphysics and not simply metaphysics, rather it's a testimony of an encounter and hence it's a metaphysic of hope for all humanity that's been built upon the experience of that encounter. In the beginning, in the beginning there was something, a word, a force, a light shining in the darkness and that something became flesh and that something had a name and the name of that something was Jesus and we met Jesus and Jesus changed us and he changed the way we think and he changed the way we live because he changed who we are and people today we continue to meet Jesus and he continues to change us 
as he continues to turn our, our metaphysics upside down. The word became flesh. We beheld his glory. Glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. <laughs>